five things experimental archaeology has taught us about prehistory? Well, I suppose it would perhaps be best to go right to the origins of experimental archaeology, the first types that we see out there. And one of the most famous was the Kentiki expedition to see if it was possible to sail a balsa raft from Peru to the Polynesian islands to see if there could be cultural transition of the two and yeah, that would be a good place to start. Much later and here in Britain we have a famous experimental archaeologist who was involved in lots of other kinds of archaeology but particularly for this year worth remembering John Coles who was involved with famous sites like the Sweet Track and while there and trying to understand the site, he was actually able to show ways that replica stone tools could create certain types of cut marks on pieces of wood that actually matched the Neolithic timbers in the ground. And he went into lots of other types of prehistory as well. And he would be, from going from the earliest to a figure in experimental archaeology, John Cole's legacy will continue to be a part of experimental archaeology for the future. Moving over to Denmark in 1985, archaeologists noticed some anomalies in the pollen curve, and that's the understanding of the way that pollen samples and pollen analysis has changed in archaeology over time. And around about 3000 BC, they noticed some anomalies. These have previously been attributed to climate change, which was possible, but these archaeologists wondered if it was possible that humans had a greater impact on the way that this pollen curve changed. So what they did was they went to the Dravet woodland nearby and they took a load of stone axes, cut down lots of trees to see if that would change the landscape. And once the trees had been felled, they were dressed for the timber, they hoed the ground and farmed it over a period before letting the woodland come back into that space. And what did they notice? That the pollen samples that they were getting from that site were exactly matching the pollen record from the Neolithic. So they could prove that people were having a much greater impact as soon as the Neolithic arrived and those stone axes to clear that woodland. Neanderthal intelligence has been up for discussion for many years and previously they've been thought to be quite stupid and unintelligent. We know that's not the case and in recent years a particular point to suggest that they were actually highly intelligent was to look at a kind of glue that they made and used and this glue came from silver birch bark. Remains of it have been found on quite a number of stone tools, but it's not a particularly easy thing to produce. It doesn't occur in nature. In more modern times, it has to be dry distilled using containers in fires to create a oil that's used to treat wood and furniture, but it can be simmered down to a much thicker, really strong tar. But without ceramics or any kind of evidence of kilns or specialized ovens, we just didn't really know how Neanderthals could have produced this product. But recently, experimental archaeologists have been able to prove that you can actually just burn a small piece of birch bark with an overhanging stone slab. And as it burns, deposits of that tar end up on the underside of that stone slab that once the bark is burned, you can just scrape it off and apply it to your stone tool. Far more effective, and it just means that we have a pretty obvious way that Neanderthals might have discovered this tar, and not with some super complex method that shows they were hugely, hugely intelligent, possibly outside their means, but we still know they were really intelligent, they would have to be. Much, much later in the prehistoric timeline, in the Bronze Age, we know that people were using bronze weapons, the time of the Trojan Wars and the Iliad saying how these great battles would be going on for a long period of time. But could those bronze weapons stand up for really long, intense engagements? Well, new research has shown that actually things like swords just wouldn't be able to withstand constant engagement, blade on blade action for too long because they would just suffer so much damage. What they have found by looking at some of the other weapons that you can get from the time, things like spearheads, that they may well have used spears, much like swords, for slashing as well as stabbing. And by looking at the way that these weapons might have actually been used, they've started to understand more about the way the objects were used by the people, as well as how the objects came to be in the ground as they're discovered by archaeologists.